voluntary work won't be exempt from tuition fees, to the dismay of some. To travel isn't a feckless thing, it isn't a waste of time, it's a very important part of your development. And if you're having to save like mad to go overseas, and you're worrying about tuition fees, then clearly you're going to feel that you have to choose between the two. Good morning, Newcastle and Paris. The university admission service is inundated with calls from anxious students. Scottish pupils got their highest results last week, but the A-level grades aren't due out until Thursday. 19,000 young people have already deferred their entry to university until next year, but they may change their minds when they hear exactly what the government's proposing on Friday. Those students will now have to make up their mind whether to rush into clearing in 1997 when they see the details of the government's policy. Now, the reports about the government's policy are at the moment a little unclear because it's not quite certain what categories are going to be given the concession that appears to be made. To add to the confusion, the National Union of Students says the government's very decision to impose tuition fees is a breach of contract. They're now intending to mount a legal challenge. The National Union of Students believes that a test case could be taken for students who entered into an agreement with universities in December of last year and now have the prospect of fees hanging over them. They entered into an agreement in good faith, shouldn't have to face the threat of fees, and we'll back them all the way in challenging this idea from the government. Government officials say they'll announce details of the scheme by the end of the week. But that doesn't clarify the situation for the thousands of A-level students waiting anxiously for their results. Laura Trevelyan, BBC News, for the Department for Education and Employment. Two people died and a baby was seriously injured after a car lost control and swerved off the road at Fleet in Hampshire. Police say the 86-year-old driver probably had a heart attack and died at the wheel before hitting a woman who was pushing her son in a pram. The mother's two-year-old daughter escaped injury. The Army has eased security precautions for soldiers in Northern Ireland following the resumption of the IRA ceasefire. From today, troops have exchanged their combat helmets for regimental berets when they're on patrol. Labour-run Doncaster Council has suspended its Director of Planning while it investigates allegations of irregularities. He's the third council officer to have been suspended. There are now three separate inquiries into the relationship between councillors and property developers at Doncaster. More than a billion fish have been killed by highly toxic algae on the east coast of America, and there are fears the algae could also be affecting humans, with over 100 fishermen and divers complaining of symptoms ranging from sores to complete memory loss. Experts say pollution is to blame for the outbreak which began in North Carolina's Noose River and now appears to be spreading along the east coast. Scientists say estuaries across the world could come under similar attack. From North Carolina, Gavin Hewitt reports. The Noose River still sparkles, but what is happening beneath the water is being seen as a warning of what may happen to rivers elsewhere. When Rick Dove, the riverkeeper, throws a net from his dock, all of the fish he catches have lesions and red sores. Similar symptoms are now occurring in the other great estuaries on America's east coast. We lost over a billion fish in a period of about 30 days. There were so many dead fish they were burying them on the beach with bulldozers. Over recent years, fishermen have watched and filmed fish kills, where the water bubbles as fish are attacked by a hidden predator. Now, some of those who work on or near the river are developing similar sores to the fish. I've been sick by it, and my friends have been sick. These sores, they come on, memory loss. I started getting sores pretty much on my arms. And uh, then on my legs, um, these are scars of where uh, been wet and just won't go away. One scientist, Dr. Joanne Burkholder, says she's identified the cause. She says the fish are being destroyed by a one-celled predator. It's so toxic that we weren't allowed in the laboratory. She filmed for us fish being put in a tank where the microbe was present. Within minutes, the fish were dying. The microorganism is called fisteria. We don't have the toxins chemically characterized yet, so we have no way of diagnosing whether a person has been hurt by fisteria, except in a laboratory setting when they've been working with toxic cultures. Her own assistant developed some of the same symptoms as the fisherman, having been exposed to fisteria in the laboratory. I lost my ability to recognize uh, people, understand conversations, and even read up to a period of about six months and had to be retrained on those particular, uh, especially the reading. 
The scientists believe these organisms may have been around for millions of years. But the natural balance in these waters has been shifted by what's poured into the river. Sewage, fertilizer, and millions of gallons of waste from pig farming. In many cases, we humans have no idea what the impacts of what we're doing will be. And we proceed along until we become overwhelmed by some catastrophe which causes us to take notice. Powerful voices continue to argue against action, insisting not enough is known. But two-thirds of the doctors here have written to the vice president with a simple message. Our people are getting sick. Gavin Hewitt, BBC News, North Carolina. A sightseeing boat in Paris has hit a bridge on the River Seine, injuring more than 20 people. It's thought the accident was caused by a fault in the boat's navigation system. A British man is in a serious condition after the double-decker boat struck the bridge near the Louvre Museum. There were 70 people on board, including nine Britons, but most were not badly hurt. Where you live may influence how long you live. That's the conclusion of a report which says people in the north are more likely to die young than those in the south. Overall, it says fewer people are dying before retirement age, but there's been greater improvement in some areas than in others. John McIntyre reports. People fortunate enough to retire in the more affluent parts of Britain, like here in Surrey, are statistically likely to live longer. Members of the Bowls Club in Cheam believe being reasonably well off with good facilities are important factors in longevity. I think people generally have a, a reasonable standard of living. Uh, they're not struggling, they're not uh, worried about the future too much. Also, I think there's less stress possibly from uh, less fear of being mugged and uh, people can walk out in the streets uh, fairly comfortably late at night. The most worrying trend, according to the Joseph Roundtree Foundation survey, is a widening gap in the north-south divide. Glasgow heads this grim table, where more men die under 65 than anywhere else in Britain. Manchester and Birmingham's mortality rates are also high. Bristol represents the average, while those at lowest risk of dying under 65 live in Surrey, Kent and Hertfordshire. We shouldn't be terrified that we're going to die because our chances of dying are lower now than they ever have been. What we should worry about are the fact that other people's chances of dying are rising relative to ours in other parts of the country, and we should start asking why that is. Dr. Dawling's exhaustive survey, based on the comparison of death rates since the 1950s, does not explain why people in Glasgow, for example, are 66% more likely to die prematurely than in, say, Dorset. Local people have their own ideas. A lot of actually unemployment in Glasgow, and unemployment means you don't have the money to actually have good diets and a good quality of life. I think it must be down to um, the smoking and drinking um, uh, attitude of uh, Scots people in general, but in Glasgow in particular, I think. I'm 78. You look unhealthy. That's your ration for the week. There's no more. It's the same. That's the lot. Well, am I supposed to the do with that? Ever since the days of food rationing, successive governments have grappled with the problems of healthy eating. People are living much longer today, but millions still face a poor choice of diet. In the city areas like Glasgow or, or parts of London, you know, there are food ghettos where it's very hard to get healthy food. There's much more pollution in inner city areas than somewhere like Dorset. For the government, the report signals a dilemma. Though it boasts a raft of measures to tackle the root causes, particularly unemployment, poor housing and pollution, it's also committed to a 25% reduction in health inequalities by the year 2000, a target it's unlikely to meet. John McIntyre, BBC News, at the Department of Health. Two men convicted of murdering the communist leader, Chris Harney, have appeared before South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They're serving life sentences, but the commission has the power to grant them amnesty if it's convinced they've revealed all they know and that the killing was political. As our Southern Africa correspondent George Alagaya reports, lawyers for the Harney family say they'll oppose any reduction in the sentences. Chris Harney's widow arrived for the hearing flanked by some of the ANC's most senior personalities. Evidence, if any were needed, of the importance the ruling party attaches to this particular case. Right-wing supporters of the two men seeking amnesty were also on hand. Their aim to show that the murder was just another violent act in South Africa's divided past. How important is it, do you think, for the whole process of national reconciliation that these men be treated exactly the same as others? Yeah, of course, I think it is important because if there is double standards, then of course it will detri be detrimental for uh, 
for the future of this country. But this was never going to be an ordinary case. Chris Harney was the ANC's favoured son, a man destined to follow in the footsteps of Nelson Mandela. Respected by the party's intellectuals, yet revered by its populist wing, Chris Harney was a man for all seasons. His murder in April 1993 very nearly unraveled the whole process that led to elections the following year. Presumably that was precisely what Harney's killers hoped would happen. To be granted amnesty, Janusz Valus, who pulled the trigger, and Clive Darby Lewis, who supplied the weapon, have to convince the Commission that they have disclosed all they know and that they were acting on behalf of a recognized political organization. They don't have to show remorse, as Mr. Harney's friends and relatives might wish. But this process is not about justice, only about setting the record straight. This case is the ultimate test, not just for the Truth Commission, but for the nation as a whole. While there's intense public pressure to keep Chris Harney's killers behind bars, the Commission has to show that it's independent and that its commitment to promoting national reconciliation is genuine. George Alagaya, BBC News, Pretoria. Here, England's defeat in the fifth test has prompted yet another round of soul-searching over the team's performance. Australia won the match by 264 runs, and the series 3-1 was just the sixth test at the Oval to go. There have already been calls for Mike Atherton to stand down as captain. Uh, sports correspondent Neil Bennett has been following today's inquest. Yeah! Malcolm has gone, and the Ashes have been retained by Australia. It's a measure of England's plight that they've now lost five Ashes series in a row, the first time that's happened in the history of contests between cricket's oldest adversaries. The need to halt the seemingly endless run of Australian celebrations is now urgent. Hence the radical blueprint for change unveiled last week by Lord McLaurin, chairman of the English Cricket Board. He wants more opportunities for talented amateurs from schools, universities and clubs to reach the top without having to go through the slog of seven-day-a-week county cricket. Tony Gregg, captain of England in the 1970s and now a commentator for Australian television, believes the net has to be cast wider to find potential English match winners. I'd like to think right now that there was a spinner in this country outside first-class cricket that was better than what we've got in first-class cricket. And, I, and I've got to tell you, I think there's a distinct possibility that that's the case. Mike Atherton had to play the good loser again at Trent Bridge. His reign as captain may or may not be nearing an end, but for now, he has the selector's support. He's had some tough press over the last three games, and, you know, he's felt it more, more than most. But, uh, you know, I'm sure he'll take a couple of days away from here and, and uh, recharge the batteries and come up fighting at the Oval. There's not much comfort ahead, though. After the last test against Australia, it's the West Indies in the Caribbean. Neil Bennett, BBC News. Main news again tonight, a new register of known child molesters is to be set up to help police keep track of sex offenders. It will contain the names of at least 6,000 convicted paedophiles. If individuals are thought to pose a particular threat, the police will now have powers to warn the communities in which they live. And a helicopter has crashed near the M6 motorway in Lancashire. Police say at least two people were killed. Emergency services are still searching through the wreckage. News nights on BBC Two at half past ten. But from the nine o'clock news, good night. Good evening. A clinic in London is offering to fly couples to America for a new treatment which it's claimed can determine the sex of a child. The London Gender Clinic claims the new sex selection method being offered in the States is up to 90% successful. But the British Medical Association says it's unethical and may even be harmful. One-year-old Daniel is Joe Bastick's fourth child and her fourth son. Ever since her daughter died from leukaemia age two, she's wanted to have another girl. Daniel was born following the failure of earlier gender selection treatment. She rejects accusations that she's simply tampering with nature. It's not designer at all because you're not choosing babies, eye colouring, hair, anything like that. All you're doing is trying to influence a particular gender, whether it be a boy or girl. The sex selection treatments being offered through the London Gender Clinic, which operates from this unassuming street in Hendon in North London. 
The technique involves separating male and female sperm using a fluorescent dye and is carried out in Virginia. The bill, excluding travel and accommodation, can reach 1,600 pounds, depending on the age of the mother. Gender selection techniques are opposed by the British Medical Association, except to avoid diseases like haemophilia, which only affects men. Others in the medical profession are worried that the dye used to select sperm could pose a danger to the unborn child. I don't think it has been sufficiently studied to see about the possibility of any defects that might be associated with offspring resulting from the technique to uh, allow its application to the human. I would be very concerned myself. Despite opposition from the medical establishment, Jo Bastig is convinced that it's worth one more try to conceive the daughter she craves for. James Cameron, Newsroom South East in Hertfordshire. The London Borough of Hounslow has admitted responsibility for the death of an 11-year-old boy who drowned on a school trip to Buckinghamshire. Adil Naeem and his classmates had been taken to an activity centre for the day, but there weren't enough qualified lifeguards at the swimming pool and they failed to spot that he'd got into difficulties. There's confusion tonight over the Great Eastern Rail Company's plans for commuters to become part-time guards. The rail union, the RMT, says the plans have been dropped. But the company itself insists it's going ahead. It says it plans to recruit new part-time guards from the hundreds of applications it's already received. And finally, Damon Hill is casting his luck and his second place in the Hungarian Grand Prix. He should have won by a mile, instead, on the last lap, the gearbox on his Arrows car failed. He was overtaken virtually in sight of the finish. The manager of the Oxfordshire team remains philosophical. Probably the most miserable team that's ever finished second in a Grand Prix in the history of Grand Prix racing. But everybody knew that we, we were going to do well there. We felt we would do well. And uh, that, you know, it's a win that we've, we've thrown away. We should have had it. And that's it. We're back in business breakfast. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good evening. Another very hot day again across central and eastern parts of England. The highest I've seen, 31 degrees, 88 Fahrenheit, at Hull Beach in the southeastern part of Lincolnshire. Now, it's ahead of this uh, cold front, the hot southeasterly winds. The cold front itself not moving very far at all over the next 24 hours, but then it will move, and these fronts from the Atlantic will bring much fresher weather to all of us, I think, during Wednesday and on Thursday. But with the high pressure following, it should turn drier and sunnier on Thursday and on Friday. Now, we do have some rain at the moment. The radar picks that up in a, a long, thin band from Dorset northwards to the West Midlands, East Wales, northwestern parts of England and central parts of Scotland, and also one or two showers just brushing past the west of Northern Ireland. As this rain drifts its way eastwards overnight, it'll fragment, and in fact many areas will become dry. But by the end of the night, more rain approaching those southwestern areas. Again, it's going to be another very warm night, particularly across the south. Central parts of London, again, may not be, low, may not be below 21 Celsius, that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Tuesday morning could well start rather grey and misty, particularly down this eastern coast again. But the sun will come through in many central and eastern areas. In the southwest, though, that rain is going to push its way steadily northeastwards through Northern Ireland, Wales, and the southwest through the afternoon. And further east, again, we may find one or two showers or storms developing, set off by the very high temperatures, not perhaps quite as high, but nevertheless 29 or 30 in those southeastern parts of Lincolnshire. Bit of a breeze round these western coasts, keeping that area cooler. But in the east, with the high temperatures, still another day of poor air quality. On Wednesday, though, that cold front pushing its way steadily eastward, taking a band of fairly sharp showers across the country, particularly in the north, but it will turn much fresher and cooler over those western areas. Still some showers in the north and indeed through the west, western parts of Wales and the southwest of England on Thursday, but for many parts of England and Wales, a dry day with a fair amount of sunshine and a bit warmer again. That's it. Good night. <laughs>